Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, we thought it would be great for us to start a little differently today. As you are aware of the recent events occurring in our world, uh, we thought it would be great for us to open up in prayer and grieve with those who are grieving right now. As far as back as October, we've seen recent events occurring, and, and it's escalated to an extent of even yesterday and today through Israel and Palestine and neighboring communities and countries. And so we know that God creates all of his children in his image, and it breaks his heart, and so it breaks our heart as well. So would you join me in praying uh, for this time? Heavenly Father. We thank you so much, Lord, because you draw near to the brokenhearted. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are here in this place and you are here in this world. And so we ask for you to show up in amazing ways. May you comfort those who are in need of comfort. Lord, may you be in your peace and your love uh, through every circumstance. So, Father, we thank you that we can go to you in prayer. We pray in your holy and precious name. Well, I want to welcome you again to Central Christian Church. And if you are a guest here today, we are thrilled that you are here. Hey, text hello to the number you see on the screen. We'd love to say hello. We'd like to hear your story and what brought you here. But we are here to gather the grow, to worship God, to thank Him for who He is and what He's doing in our lives. So prepare our hearts and do this right now as we join Him and lifting our voices and focusing on Him. Amen. Hey, will you rise to your feet? We're going to worship today. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul reminds us to pray without ceasing and to give thanks in any circumstance. So no matter what we're facing, no matter what's going on in the world around us, our God is still worthy. And that's why we were here to give him praise today. Amen. Let's do
Jesus. We worship you in this place. We pray this in your name. Everybody said, amen. You can be seated today. Praise because you're faithful. Praise because you're true. Praise because there's nobody greater than you. Church, we always have a reason to praise God because of his faithfulness, his grace, his mercy, his love to us each and every day. For these reasons alone, we have a reason to praise God. As Jesus followers, we recognize that he is Lord over our life and in him all things are made new and that everything belongs to him because it was created by a God who desires a relationship with us. In Psalm 24, 1, it says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. He is the ultimate provider in our life, and because of that, he wants our trust and our attention on him at all times. The generosity that is shown to us is the ultimate example of how generosity should be displayed in our own lives. You see, it's a crazy thing when we realize God has trusted us with being stewards of what he has given us. And that's why we get an incredible opportunity to build his kingdom, to give back to him, and to bring people to Jesus through our generosity. And that's why Central gets to reach the people we do. It's because of the generosity of the church. It's because of you. So thank you so much for those of you that do give. And if you're still trying to figure out what that looks like, man, pray about it. Invite God into that conversation. And we invite you to be a part of what God is doing here at Central. You can give online, on the app, or at the giving boxes at the back of the room. I know for many of us, this idea of always having a reason to praise God can be hard. When the valleys are really low, when things are just not going our way, when all seems lost. But we get this choice, this choice to rest in the fact that Jesus died for us. That a God of the universe who created you and me and all of creation would choose to send his son to die on the cross for the days when we feel all is lost. For the days that we feel all seems hopeless, for the days that we just don't feel like praising God. He chose us. He chooses us every single day. In church, we get to remember that together. That's why we take communion as a body of Christ, to reflect, to praise, to remember the sacrifice on the cross that changed everything. In a moment, I'm gonna pray, and then you will have an opportunity to take these elements. As a reminder, we take and eat the bread that represents the body of Christ. And we take and drink the juice that represents the blood of Jesus that was spilled for us that day on the cross. Let's pray together. Awesome God, God, thank you for who you are. God, we are so grateful that we get to share this space with you to reflect, to remember, to praise, to give you all the glory for what happened on the cross, God. The day that changed everything. The day that we were saved by grace, saved by your love, your mercy, so that we may have a relationship with you. God, we give you this time as we celebrate and remember it together. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Good morning, 
to you. Man, it's great to see you guys. And I want to welcome you. If you are on any of our campuses across the valley, wherever you are, uh, man, again, you're on our hearts and on our minds and our prayers. We think about you all the time. If you're watching online, you also matter to us. And you can be locally, you can be in the state somewhere, you could be in the country somewhere, or you can be in the world somewhere. Uh, you matter to us as well. Hey, uh, I'm going to get to the message here in just a moment. And um, there, there's a couple of things. I, I said them last week. I just got to say them again. There's a couple of things that are going to happen this week that I just don't want you to miss. And so I just want to give you a heads up again. And, and that is this Thursday night and Sunday, when we have services this next weekend, it's going to be a very special day in our church's history. Um, it was 25 years ago that we said goodbye to the prior lead pastor, uh, Dr. Leroy Lawson, and he's going to be back next week. He's going to be our guest. He's like 85, 87, something like that. The guy is still a dynamo. If you don't know him, have never met him, you're going to love him. He's going to bring the message next week. And then next week also... Uh, Sean Moyers, who is going to be the next lead pastor, not yet, but a year from now, he is going to be beginning his ministry with us. So we're going to have three generations of lead pastors, and it's going to be a special celebration, and we'll hear more about that later. But I just don't want you to miss it. It's, it's Thursday night. It's the Sunday services. And then also, I want to just remind you that Saturday is mobilized. Uh, all, all campuses, we're doing stuff. We're trying to serve uh, single moms. We're trying to serve uh, the homeless. We're trying to serve schools. We're trying to serve ministries. There's all kinds of opportunities, and I just don't want you to miss them. So put that on your radar. Put it on your calendar. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get to the Bible. Luke chapter 8. And that's what you need to find. Bring a Bible when you come to church. It always makes it more interesting. Also uh, allows you to become familiar with it and not so intimidated by it. And it's not a hard book to understand once you kind of just get the gist of it. But you'll never get that if you don't become familiar with handling it. So bring your Bible. Uh, we're going to continue today in a series that we started last week. It's called Crossroads. And the idea behind Crossroads is the idea of choices. That you come to a point in your life where you could go this way or you could go that way. That, that uh, this uh, choice will take you to that place and that choice will take you to that other place. But you can't make this choice to get to that other place. That this choice goes that direction. This, you know, this choice goes this particular direction. That choice goes that particular direction. And they don't go to the same places. So the point we're talking about is that you in your life have to make choices. You can't get around it. And you make them every single day. And, and a lot of the choices we come to at Crossroads, we don't even think much about where we're going to go. You can spend your entire life and just end up wherever you end up. Or you can intentionally go, I want to go from here to there, have a there in your mind, and then very clearly choose the right path that will get you there. there. There's a classic scene you might remember as a kid reading Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll is this novel about this girl, and, and uh, her name's Alice, and, and there's a scene in there that I want to just draw your attention to. There's a scene where she comes to a fork in a road. And she's confused. She doesn't know which way to go. She doesn't know which one to choose. And she looks up in the tree and she sees a cat. It's the Cheshire cat. The Cheshire cat talks. And so she has a conversation. Let me read to you what it says, uh, how he wrote this. He, uh, Alice said, would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? Well, the cat said, well, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. And then Alice said, well, I don't much care where. Then the cat said, then it doesn't much matter which way you go. Uh, well, so long as I get somewhere, Alice said, and the cat said, well, you certainly will get somewhere if you'll simply walk long enough. So many people just end up their life wherever they just end up. I don't want to be that kind of a person. My guess is you probably don't want to be that kind of a person. You can live it randomly or you can live it on purpose. Now, here's the, uh, an idea that I want to make sure you understand. This is very important. Your destination is not determined by your intention but by your direction. It's a very important principle. I, I didn't want to end up here. Well, it doesn't matter. You, you went this direction. You made these choices. But this is where I want to be. It doesn't matter. It's not about your intention. Your, your destination is determined by the direction you go and the choices you make. And, and so the big idea for this entire series, as I introduced it last week, is this. You first make your choices, and then your choices make you. You see, you are the sum total of the choices you've made. And if you're in great shape, it's because you've chosen certain things that have put you in great shape. And if you're in horrible shape, it's because you've made choices that have made you in horrible shape and in the condition of your life. And it's true for you, it's true for me, it's true for everyone. So we gotta make some choices. Now, the idea behind Crossroads and what we're doing in this series is we're putting 
um, two people up against each other in the Bible that were similar but different, similar in the sense that they had a choice to make, but they made different choices. And we're just kind of showing the difference. So last week I talked about the two men that were uh, hung with Jesus on the cross, that were crucified with Jesus. There was one on his right and one on his left. And they couldn't have been more similar. They were both criminals. They were both outlaws. They were both getting exactly what they deserved. They, they were exactly where their choices took them, but one of them responded very differently than the other one. And this is last week's message. I'm not re-preaching it, but the idea is this one over here is mocking Jesus, heaping insults at him. Hey, if you're who he said you were, get us down from here. Hey, Mr. God, fix this. The other one's going, do, do you not fear God? You're going to say this to this guy? We deserve this. That guy did nothing wrong. And then he basically said he believed in Jesus. And then he said to Jesus, please remember me when, when you enter heaven. And he said, I promise you I will. And you'll be there with me. And we talked about that last week. And if you didn't hear it, go back and listen to it. Choices make a difference. It's not your intention. It's the direction you, you, you go. And, and so today what I want to do is I want to juxtapose two other people that couldn't be more different than those first two. The first two were bad men. They were criminals. They were the law caught up with them, all right? The, the two that I wanna to contrast today are both very wealthy, very successful businessmen, men that we might look at and go, I wanna end up like them, I wanna be one of them. Now, you might or might not decide that, but they're as different as they could be. Now, before I show you this, I wanna just ask you a question. It's really important you work through this. How do you handle news you don't wanna hear? Now, all of us would say, oh, no, no, I'm really good. I just, you know, I, yeah, I just, I, I like feedback and I, I think it's really positive. It's the right answer. But the truth of the matter is a lot of times when we hear something we don't want to hear, we react negatively to it. We, we basically shut our minds and ears and eyes. A lot of times when you hear things you don't want to hear, and folks, you hear things you don't want to hear. You just do. You hear it from your doctor. He says, I need to explain to you what's going on. And he has to tell you something you really don't want to hear. You hear it from your accountant or financial advisor or whoever you used to do your taxes. When the, sometimes you go, I, I got to tell you something, you got to owe a lot of money. You hear it sometimes from your spouse or your significant other in your life. They say, you know, we got to talk. And you go, no, oh, no. Or, or you hear it from the, the counselor that you go to because you and your wife couldn't talk, Right. You hear it, it just comes at us. You, you're getting a job evaluation and the guy goes, well, here's the three good things I can say, but here's 10 things we gotta talk about. How do you handle it? We would love to believe that all of us are just open to feedback and we just listen. The truth of the matter is a lot of us do this. We cross our arms, we lean back and we shut down. I don't wanna hear what I don't wanna hear. I just don't wanna hear it. I don't wanna deal with it, I don't wanna think about it. That's a choice. Or you can choose open your arms, open your mind, lean forward and listen and think it through. That's what I'm hoping you'll choose today because Jesus is gonna say some things and I'm gonna say some things that you probably don't wanna hear, but it's just saying what Jesus said. And so kind of brace yourself because it's really easy to go, no, no, I'm good, I'll process hard truth. But will you when it actually comes at you? We'll see in just a moment. But let's go to Luke chapter 18. We're going to be in Luke 18. We're going to be in Luke 19. These two stories almost come on top of each other. Couldn't be scripted better. Um, so let's, let's get into it. All right. The biggest choice you're going to make is what you do with God. Choose it carefully. The biggest choice you're going to make. What are you going to do with God? Don't. No. So let me, uh, let me introduce you to the first of these two characters. Again, we're going to put two people up against. The first one's going to take me longer than the second one. So just bear with me. The first one is a guy that we know as his title, although it's not official, he's just known as the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler. Now, you go, how in the world do you get the title, the rich young ruler? Well, he's talked about in three of the four biographies. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about this guy. And they all add a little bit of different things. Matthew tells us he was young. Luke tells us he was a ruler. And they all tell us he was wealthy. Now, when it says a ruler, let's just get something clear. This is not a king. This is not a you know, an ambassador. This is a guy who is a boss. This is a guy who has clout. This is a guy who, when he speaks, people listen. When he says, jump, you jump. This is a guy of prominence. He's a Jewish man of some prominence. That's what you need to understand. And um, again, they all say that he's wealthy. He's very successful. Everybody knows him. Everybody knows about him. Uh, he has uh, made, he's made a mark and, and people just, I think, admire him because of that. Okay. But here's what I need you to understand. Let's just plant the seed right now. 
This guy is as successful as most of us would ever dream of being. But here's what you need to think about. He had it all, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And it wasn't enough because of where he's going to go with Jesus. And I want you to just think about that. He had it all, but it wasn't enough. Okay, so let's just jump in here. So Luke uh, 18. Uh, Luke, oh, no, wait. Luke 18, verse, I believe I'm in 18. I'm not sure that's right. Is it right? It is right. Okay, here we go. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That's how the whole conversation begins. Comes up to Jesus, good teacher, how, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the first thing I need to tell you is saying good teacher, that's just weird. Now that might not strike your ears as weird, but that is weird. That is not the way you would approach Jesus. The way you would approach somebody like Jesus would be to say rabbi or good rabbi. Uh, when, when you say good teacher, there's, the, the, it, it caught Jesus's ear. And I know it caught Jesus's ear because the next verse he's gonna respond to that statement. Why did he call him good teacher? Well, it could be flattery, you know, just kind of buttering him. It could be that he's setting him up to debate him. Jesus, you know, hey, good teacher, you're so smart, you know? And so he, Jesus doesn't know, but it caught his ear. It was a weird way. Now, what's really gonna get weird is the question is gonna be who's truly good? You'll see it in just a moment. But then the guy goes on to ask a question, which is a very important question. It's a question you and I ought to be asking. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? It's a critical question. Let me translate it. What do I have to do to go to heaven? What do I have to do to be saved? What do I have to do to live in such a way that when I get to the end of my life, I don't look back on my life and regret the choices I made? That's what he's asking. What do I have to do? I mean, explain it to me. You know, I, I want to get this one right and uh, I, want to, I want to be saved. Now, it's almost as if, though, and, and follow this, this guy has a vast portfolio. It's almost as if his wealth was going to help him to acquire what it's going to take to, eternal, to, to gain eternal life. In other words, somehow I, I want to add this to my portfolio of achievements. I want to add this to my successes. I want to add this to my bottom line. What do I have to do to add this? As if somehow, and this sometimes can be confusing, as if somehow if I'm successful in the world, I can translate my success in the world to translate into a success with God. What do I have to do? I need, I need some of that. Which means that all that he had was not enough and he was looking for more. That's just important to keep in mind. Uh, and by the way, he, he was very, very clear. What must I do? Don't miss this. What must I do? That was the question. What must I do? In other words, not what you did or anyone else did. What do I do? Im implying I've, I've got to achieve something. What is my achievement going to do that's going to get me eternal life? Not what you did, but what am I going to do? All right, just hold on to all that. So then Jesus responds to the first part about the good teacher. He says, why do you call me good? That's just an interesting response on Jesus' part. Hey, good teacher, why do you call me good? You see, the implication of calling Jesus good is, so Jesus goes on to say, look, there's no one good but God himself. So are you saying you acknowledge that I'm God? And Jesus, whenever he claimed to be God, he was claiming to be good. And he, in fact, was good. He's the only man that ever lived that didn't sin, according to scripture. He was truly good, but he wants to know, why are you calling me good? Now, here's what you need to understand. And, and if you don't get this, this won't make sense. This guy that's asking Jesus, the good teacher, this questions, he thinks he's really good because he's had so much success. He thinks he's really good. So by calling Jesus good, it sets up this kind of a weird uh, dynamic. Now, let's go on from there, all right? So Jesus goes, well, uh, keep the commandments. Uh, in fact, let's just read it, all right? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. Well, that's interesting. He just rattles off a list of 10 commandments, but he only listed five. He just, and by the way, could you off the top of your head come up with five of the 10 commandments? We used to be so familiar with the 10 commandments. We have so minimized the 10 commandments. We don't push them out of the mind. We don't, we don't display them in schools anymore. We don't put it in courthouses anymore. We don't see them anymore. But he just rattles off five of the 10. And it sounds like he was, it was just like random. Like he just randomly picked five. Folks, he didn't randomly pick five. He chose five very intentionally. Let me explain it. <clears throat> Commandments one through four have to do with your relationship with God. Commandments five through 10, 
So four have to do with you and God. Six of them have to do with how you are with people. What Jesus quoted him was five, six, seven, eight. I'm wrong. Nine. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. And uh, he just, again, that's in the order, he just rattles them. All right. So you go, what in the world is going on here? So he lists these five, and then the guy's response, that's what you gotta see. Keep the commandments, okay? Like which ones? Like these ones, okay? And then, he, and, and then he says this in verse 21, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now stop for just a moment. All of these I have kept since I was a boy? This is a young Jewish man growing up, going, yep, honor your father and your mother. Oh, I never failed to do that. Okay, never bear false witness, never failed to do that. Do not sin, never stole a thing in my life. I, the audacity to say, all of these I have kept all my life. And again, different, trans, different uh, you know, biographers give you different input. He's absolutely going, check, 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 check. I got it done. All of this, I got it done. I'm good. Now, I just got to tell you the audacity. I've kept those commandments some of the time. And some of them I've never, I've never murdered anybody. But to say I've always honored my mother and father, you gotta be kidding, I haven't done that. I doubt you have either if you wanna be truthful about it, but he says he did. What he's saying is, I'm good. Now I want you to process this, of all the things that he felt so good about himself, I did this, that, check, 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 and he still didn't feel good enough. Folks, you will never find peace with God with a checklist of things of do's and don'ts. I don't know how we got this into religion. And I don't know how we got this into Christianity. I don't know how we got this into our faith that God is looking for you to be able to check some boxes. And if you can check all the boxes, you're good. You can check all the boxes and you still in your heart can go, I'm not right. He knew he wasn't right with God. He knew that Jesus had something he didn't have. And he's basically going, Jesus, what do I got to do? I've done all this stuff, but I don't have what you have. So what do I have to do to get it? And so here we go. Um, when Jesus heard this, I've done all this. He said to him, now listen carefully, get ready. You want to hear what you don't want to hear. You still lack one thing. You got it all, but you're lacking one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. Get rid of all your stuff and then you can become one of mine. Now, I want to show you something because it sounds like he just slammed that guy, man, just punked him, just put him down. Like you think you got, man, boom. Now you feel good about yourself because he, he's got a lot of stuff. In Mark, when Mark tells this part of the story, it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now, don't miss that. This was not to put him down. This was Jesus's compassion, telling him what he didn't want to hear, but what he desperately needed to hear. And, and, and you go, why did he so desperately need to hear this? Because while he might have been faithful in his own mind at keeping those ones that Jesus listed, do you know the Ten Commandments? Because he skipped the first four, the ones that had to do with his relationship with God. Do you know what the first of the Ten Commandments is? And don't feel bad if you don't. But do you know what the first one is? Exodus 20, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. That's number one. Now, wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. What Jesus did was look at him, sized him up, realized that this man's success was his God. This man's wealth was his God. This man's stuff is what this man was living for. And this man had a God ahead of the Father God, his stuff. So Jesus basically is saying, look, there's an obstacle between you and the Father, and until you get rid of it, you're not going to, you want eternal life. Get, get rid of the stuff that's blocking your path. Now, let's just talk about this, uh, lo loving God. You, you, you might remember uh, that one time Jesus was asked, hey, which is the greatest of the Ten Commandments? Which is the greatest one? And, and, and it's interesting, in uh, Matthew 22, Jesus said, well, he goes, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, and listen, listen. The greatest one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now, this is the first and the greatest commandment. So this guy, I've done all the commandments. And Jesus goes, well, you skipped one. The most important one, love God before you love anything else. Love, uh, whoa, whoa. Now, can I just point a couple things out that I think are really important? You, you got to understand, this guy has a lot. 
And, and, and Jesus basically says, you're going to have to make a choice between all your stuff and God. And, uh, it, you know, th- let's be clear, that would be a bit of a dilemma. So this guy's processing this, and he's like going, hmm. And, and by the way, did you notice what Jesus said to do with it? He didn't say, just get rid of your stuff. He didn't say, just go destroy your, he didn't say, put all your stuff in a dumpster. He didn't say, go burn all your stuff. You know, what he said was, I want you to take all your stuff and I want you to put other people ahead of yourself. Give it to the poor. It's very different than just destroy and just, you know, jettison it. He said, no, go use it. You see, what Jesus was saying to him is put other people ahead of yourself, which this guy's probably never done. Care about people more than you care about yourself. And so this guy's processing it and he's like going, wow. Well, he sees, Jesus sees on his face that what's going to happen is he's going to choose poorly. So Jesus says to him, and, and by the way, again, give the guy credit for the fact that he's at least thinking about eternal life. We don't even do that so well anymore. We live in a culture that is so now, so FOMO oriented, so like of this moment we don't think about the consequences of the choices we're making. You want to know why so many people's lives are screwed up? Because they don't think about where those choices lead them. We live here today. Just give it to this guy. He's thinking about tomorrow. He's thinking about eternity. Good on him. But the price to be right with God for eternity. And it's like, no. So anyway, he, Jesus looks at him in verse 23. Um, <clears throat> when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. His face, his countenance just dropped when Jesus said, sell, sell all your stuff, just dropped. Like, uh, drain the blood out of him. You gotta be kidding me. And then Jesus said, and he looked at him and said this, this is what you need. It, it says he looked at him. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to inherit the kingdom of God. Well, we go, well, yeah, those rich people, yeah, they all deserve to go to the other place. Us poor people, the only problem is, <clears throat> folks, we can praise God, we're not rich. <laughs> Thank God I'm not rich. We are unbelievably rich compared to the rest of the world. So for us to just go, well, I'm glad he's not talking to me. It does not get us, I know you don't want to hear that, but the truth of the matter is, is we are richer than most people on the planet. If you know anything, you know that. How hard it is for the rich. Why is it so hard for the rich? because our stuff becomes too important to us. What car we drive, what house we live in, what you know, vacations we take, what we post on. We need people to understand we are successful. Look at the, you know, the handbag my wife carries. We're successful people. And uh, we don't like the idea of, you know what, if you wanna have eternal life and any of that stuff comes to mean more to you than a relationship with your father in heaven, that stuff is your downfall. So this guy looks at it and he goes, well, that's not going to happen. So Jesus goes, how hard it is. And then Jesus says this statement, it, indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, don't hear if, you, if you're one of y'all, one of us, one of us rich Americans, we, none of us are going to go to heaven, don't hear that. What he's saying is, it's difficult when you have a Wired material stuff. And when you have a sense of security because of your securities, when your portfolio is strong, it's hard to become dependent upon God like you used to be when you had nothing. Wealth literally can magnify to blur our vision, to blind us of our real need. So the easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, th- there's a lot behind that. I don't have time. I just want to explain. It was a literal needle he was talking about, and it was, the idea, it was hyperbole, exaggeration of a camel going through it. It's going to be tough. Now, he's not saying it can't be done, because the truth of the matter is, is the rich can go to heaven and the poor can go to heaven. The young can go to heaven, the old can go to heaven. We can just keep doing this all day long. It, it's not who you are, it's who Jesus is to you. You can be rich, and if Jesus is who he ought to be to you, you're fine. Because Jesus will mean more to you than your wealth. But if your wealth means more to you than Jesus, you're in trouble. So, uh, those who heard it asked, well, then who can be saved? You've got to understand, in that culture, and even to this day, Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish people and prosperity were kind of connected. 
And so these people that are hearing Jesus say this, his disciples are going, well, wait, wait, we were taught to grow up and become wealthy. And that wealth is like, it's a sign of blessing of God. And, and so they're processing this and they're just confused. Who then could be saved? Now that's a loaded question. Um, Jesus said, well, what's impossible with man is possible with God. What does that mean? Who can be saved? Now listen, this is so important. Listen to me. Who can be saved? Not the person who's going to rely on themselves. Not the person who wants what they've achieved more than they want what Jesus has achieved. Who can be saved? Everyone who relies on Jesus. Who can't be? It's impossible for somebody who won't rely on Jesus to be saved. And folks, he's talking to you and he's talking to me. It's that personal. It's that real. That is what it's going to take. It's going to take your love for God being greater than your love for anything you've ever done, anything you've ever become, anything you've ever gotten, anything you've ever accomplished. And you're going to have to rely on him. And to get there, you're going to have to make a choice. It's going to be about him. It's not going to be about you. And it's kind of harder than it sounds. What is impossible with man is possible with God. You can't save yourself. He can. He can save you. All kinds of people. And Peter said to him, well, we've left everything to follow you, just so we're clear. And truly, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come. Eternal life. Here, here, here let me translate that, okay? If you put Jesus first in your life, no matter what price that costs you, the benefit is greater. If you will put Jesus first in your life, the benefit of that decision is going to be greater than any cost you're going to pay. And the cost can be there. The cost can separate you from your family. We talked about that at Easter. It can separate you from your friends where they like, what are you doing? I don't, you're, not, you're not the same person you used to be. You're right. I'm not. And, and so there sometimes is a cost, but no price you pay. If you have Jesus, are you going to come out behind it's when you have all your stuff and you lost Jesus in the process, you, you have your relationship that you wouldn't let go of that was illicit and inappropriate, but you have that, but you don't have, that's the price of the wrong choice. Now, let me show you the second window. Take us much, it's much easier, it's much simpler. Uh, it just jumped down to the next chapter. I said they were like back to back. Thank you, Luke, for doing that. It makes it really easy for me. I want to introduce you to a guy named Zacchaeus. Okay, now you might know about Zacchaeus. If you went to Sunday school, you maybe know a little bit about Zacchaeus. We're going to be in Luke 19. Go quickly through this, verses 1 to 10. Zacchaeus, or Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Uh, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Okay, so we got the similarity now. He's, this guy's highly successful. He's a chief. He's the boss. He's the head honcho. He's the tax collector, all the other tax collectors answer to. He's the man, okay? And so while the rich young ruler was very wealthy and kind of, you know, we talked about him, we got to understand this guy parallel. He's just wealthy as well. And, uh, <clears throat> but the problem is he's a tax collector. Now, even in our culture, tax collectors don't have like a really positive ring. And if that's you, I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> but <clears throat> we don't tend to like tax collectors, okay? We don't like calls from the IRS. But in that day, you've got to understand there's a whole lot going on here because tax collectors, now let me explain how it worked. Rome conquered Israel and it conquered a whole bunch of Roman Empire. That made all the Israelites subject to the powers of Rome, which means that they put the governors and the, and the authorities and the rules over the, the uh, people of Israel. Uh, part of what that meant is the people of Israel now have to pay Rome their taxes because Rome is the occupying force. They're the power. And you got to understand the Jewish people hated this. And, and then to get the money, what the, the Romans would do is they would hire Jewish people to be their tax agents, their tax collectors. And they would compensate them for, ex for literally for extracting the funds out of the Jewish people. So the Jewish people looked at the people who were the tax collectors as traitors and turncoats. You're serving the wrong God. You're serving the enemy. And, and then what made it worse was that they were known to literally, uh, you know, bump the number up. Like, yeah, this is technically what you owe, but this is what it's going to cost. And the people couldn't do anything about it because they had the power of Rome behind them. So tax collectors were like the least liked people in the culture. 
They were like the scum that nobody wanted anything to do with. But we got this guy who's the chief tax collector. This guy, super successful. Everything's going for him, all right? And you just got to realize there's absolutely no love for these kind of guys. Maybe different than the other guy. I think he was admired. This guy was not admired. He was hated. Now, <clears throat> look at verse 3. Verse 3 is, gets fun. Verse 3 says, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. This is awesome. Zacchaeus is a short little guy. And by the way, so is Roy Lawson next week. I didn't mention that to you, but you'll see it next week when you're here. Uh, Zacchaeus uh, has heard about Jesus. It, it, Jesus is like a rock star, but they don't have, they don't have Instagram. They don't have the ability to shoot a video and send it out. He's heard of Jesus, has many, but he never saw him. But here he discovers he's coming this way. And yet he wants to see him, but he's short and he can't see over the crowd. And, and by the way, you remember going to Sunday school and learning about this? We, we, if you went to Sunday school as a kid, you probably on a flannel graph had little pictures of little short Zacchaeus and, and climbing up a tree to see Jesus. You'll get that in just a moment. And so we even sing songs. You remember the song? Zacchaeus, he was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He crawled up into the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Am I, am I the only one? Am I it? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Catch, catch my act. I'll be here till Tuesday. Anyway, um, so he's got to come up with a plan. And so the next verse tells us what it was. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Can we just admit that for this guy, that's a lacking of dignity? Can I get an amen? This is a successful chief tax collector who's going, I don't care what it costs. I don't care what it costs my reputation. I want to see Jesus. Now I've got to crawl up in the tree. I'm going to crawl up in the tree. And he does. Now, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Folks, this has got so much in it. Doesn't it fascinate you that Jesus is walking along and he sees a dude up in a tree and he notices. That's the first thing. A sycamore tree is a full leafed tree. It's not a little thin thing. He looks up, he sees this guy and then they've never met. If they had met, it wouldn't be the same story. He looks up and he goes, Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is going, what? <laughs> like, you know me? I, thought, I find that fascinating. Jesus looked at him, Zacchaeus, that's Zacchaeus. Uh, and then he says, you come down immediately. Can I just say that's a little rude? Get out of that tree, Zacchaeus. Like, get out now, down now. And, and Zacchaeus is like, what? Like, but do you notice what he does? Immediately he comes down and it says he does it gladly. I mean, he just like hops down at once because Jesus said, get out of that tree. And then he says, I need to go to your house. Okay, that seems a little weird, a little forward when you say, if I just walked up to you and said, hey, I need to have lunch with you today at your house. You look at me and go, well, well you've been smoking, pastor. It'd be weird, right? And that's what Jesus does. He goes, Zacchaeus, you need to come down now because I got to go to your house now. And so he does, does it at once. He does it gladly. He just pops out of the tree. And several times you can see Jesus. He can see people's motivations. Like he could see the face of that guy fall when, when he said, give away. And he could see Zacchaeus. He just goes, yeah, you know what? I know what's going on, Zacchaeus. He can see the character and the integrity and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, at once. And this is where it gets fascinating. Verse 7. Don't miss verse 7. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. There you go. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, can I stop right here and go, who in the right mind would worry about him going to be the guest of a sinner except who? Religious people. Religious people are the ones who are upset he doesn't even know who that guy is. He thinks that guy's a good guy. That guy is a scum. That guy is a lowlife. That guy, nobody likes him. And there he goes to go have lunch with him. That tells you how much Jesus knows. And uh, they clicked their tongues. They rolled their eyes. They showed disgust that Jesus is going to go off with this guy. And if he knew who that guy was, all that kind of thing. Folks, the only people that would do that are religious people. I hate to say it because I are one. And you probably are one too. But here's the deal. Uh, Jesus um, listens to them mutter 
And just like he didn't bargain with the guys when he walked away, he doesn't turn to them and go, what are you muttering about? And by the way, mutter is a fascinating, uh, mutter is one of those words you learn in school, it's called an onomatopoeia. An onomatopoeia is a word, when you say it, you do it. So the word hiss, you say it, you do it, hiss, buzz, mutter. You don't mutter without muttering. Muttering is to say something disgusting in a low tone, mutter, mutter. You can't get there without, mutter. <laughs> it doesn't work, mutter. And so Jesus hears them muttering. They're disgusted at him for loving on that guy. You know what he was doing? Church, you might not want to hear this, but he was loving beyond the line. That's what he was doing. All these people had no, there's no redeeming trait in that guy whatsoever. I don't want anything to do with him. Jesus goes, I'm going to go hang out with you today. I don't know what it is with us Christians. We have this thing that we think that all good people would avoid people that are less than popular people. It's not true. And Jesus, you know, and again, he's not condoning everything this guy did. But he's basically going, you're a person made in the image of God. I'm going to show you dignity. I want to go have lunch with you today. And as that kid's probably going, I can't even believe. I cannot believe. Now, I want to show you what happens because this is fascinating. Zacchaeus comes climbing out of the tree. And uh, he, he says, Zacchaeus stood up, got down off the He probably fell out of the tree, probably shocked. You know me. You welcome me. Falls out of the tree. I'm making that up. I don't know that. But Zacchaeus stood up, which meant he was down. He stood up and he said to the Lord, and watch this response. Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now you've got to stop and you've got to go, that's the first thing that came out of his mouth? I will, I, right now, God, I'm just going to tell you, half of what I got. I'm giving to the poor. And uh, if I've cheated anybody, now let me just say this. When you hear a tax collector in this day say, if I've cheated anybody, it's not what he's, what he's saying is all those I've cheated. Like, is there like a honest casino out there anywhere? Hey, I want you to come to my casino. We're an honest casino. You've got a 50-50 chance of winning or losing. There's no honest casino out there. It's a rigged game. If I'm a tax collector, I'm going to extort money. If I've cheated anybody, I mean, everyone I've cheated, I'll pay back four times. Here's what I need you to understand. This is what you cannot miss. Jesus didn't ask him to do that. He asked the other guy to give away everything. He didn't say that to this guy at all. He didn't say anything. The guy goes, I'm going to give away everything. When you come to know Jesus, your motivations change. You know why this guy, you know why he didn't get the Ten Commandment message, sermon? And the guy didn't have a problem. The fact that he could, hey, half of what I got, man, it's gone. He, it's not his God. That is not his issue. And if it's not your issue, I'm telling you, you don't have to give away your stuff. If it's your God, you do. It's blocking your view of God. But you can possess, that's what, rich and poor can be saved. That's the point. And so the next verse closes this, and this is what it says. Jesus said to him, today, salvation has come to this house. What, what does that mean? What must I do to be saved? You do this. You respond to Jesus by making a choice like this, which is just put him first. You just put him first. And whatever else happens, happens. Because this man too is a son of Abraham. What does that mean? He's one of us. He's in the, he's in the group. He's, he's welcome in, into my group. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Listen to me, church. The mission of Jesus, the passion of Jesus is that people who were far from his father come home. Is that you? You, you, you got to understand Jesus is looking at you. If that's you, he's looking at you. Uh, see, we think well, this is what we get wrong. We think Jesus came to earth to love all the religious people. And Jesus said, the healthy don't need a physician. It's the sick. I have come to seek and to save those who are sick. What does that mean? I need help. I need God. Oh, you know you need God? I am for you. So what does all this mean? Let me close. What's it all mean? Uh, let me first say this. I think that we have attachment issues as a culture. We love stuff. We love putting things. We love the idea of status and success. We love the houses, the boats, the cars, the purses, the, all those things. 
all, all signs, clothing, anything that carries status, man, we dig it. If that status of that thing, whatever that is, means more to you than God, that God is your thing. Or that thing is your God, however you wanna say that. And Jesus goes, that's gotta go. And I don't know what it would be for you, but I think for a lot of us, and listen carefully, because I'm gonna say something, I'm gonna drop something on you. Many of us would prefer our own accomplishments to Jesus's accomplishments. In other words, we go, God, I'm good. I don't need any help. I'm good. I've done all these things. I want to go to heaven. I'll go on my own merit. I'll go there because I'm going to convince you, God, I'm good enough, which is so audacious. God, I'm good. I don't need your help. Well, with man, that's impossible. The only way you're going to get into heaven is with Jesus' help. And so to do that, you have to, you have to go, I need help. But I'll tell you what, you know what we do is we just cluster little bony fingers around things. I don't know what that thing is for you. It could be a possession, it could be a relationship, it could be success, it could be status, it could, I don't know what it is. We, hold on, over my bony little dead fingers, will you pry this out? And Jesus comes along and he's just basically going, I don't know how to tell you this, but that's keeping you out. It's kind of like the story with a, uh, ape puts his hand in the jar, squeezes the candy, can't get his hand out. You're holding on. So here's the question, and it's a, it's a sharp question. It's an uncomfortable question. What, in, 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 in truth, what would you rather go to hell with than heaven without? You gotta think it. What is it that you want so badly? I'm never gonna let go of this. I'd rather go to hell with this than just release it and let God come first and go to heaven. You know, Jesus offers you eternal life. He offers you forgiveness. He offers you grace. He offers you a better life. And the thing that's the hardest thing is you get this by receiving a gift, not by accomplishing something you do. I, I read this last week. I got to read it again. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And, and this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works that you can brag about it. Man, you were designed by God to need God. You're normal if you need God. You were made to need God. But you gotta make a choice. Are you gonna trust in him or are you gonna trust in you? Revelation 3.20 says he stands at the door and knocks. I think this is fascinating in our culture. In our culture, what happens, when, just be honest with me, okay, wherever you are, be honest. What happens when somebody knocks on your door these days? You do one of two things. I know you do. You hide. <laughs> you hide or you embrace. Meaning you, you go, shh, everyone on the floor. Now or you get up and you answer the door. And Jesus says, uh, I, I'm gonna knock on your door, Revelation 3, I'm gonna knock on your door. And um, if you'll open your door and invite me in, I'll, I'll come in. We'll do life together. It'll be you and me. But he won't break your door down. You don't answer the door, you chose not to. He won't come in. I love this. So I'm telling you all this to say that we're going to give you a choice this morning. And this is why we started late. So apologies all across the central world here. We started late because so many people said yes to Jesus in the last hour. It just took a while. And uh, I hope this service runs long, just so you know. Because if people are saying yes to Jesus, there's nothing more important that we could be doing than celebrating the fact that some people change their eternity they asked Jesus, what do I have to do to be saved? And he said, choose me, and they did. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray in just a moment. The band's gonna come out in its entirety. Uh, you guys can start working your way out here. Um, uh, maybe you can't, I don't know. We're broadcasting this everywhere, I don't know. Do whatever you have to do, guys. <laughs> Let me get back to this. Here's what we're gonna do, though. In a moment, I'm gonna ask you to stand. I'm gonna ask you not to leave. Please, there's nothing more important. Your brunch will wait. Okay, it will. And then we're going to just invite you to say yes to Jesus. And the way you do that here is you walk forward here. And this is on all of our campuses. Online is a little bit different. We'll talk about that later. And you just walk down here and you get a towel. These towels are so significant. They are white for a reason. Two reasons. White symbolizes surrender. 
Everybody knows when you wave a white flag, you're saying, I'm done. Don't shoot me. Don't kill me. Don't destroy me. I give up. It's your chance to surrender to God. All worship, by the way, comes from a surrendered heart. I choose you. I give up. I'm not doing this on my own anymore. God, I've had enough of me. I want you. And white symbolizes purity. Scripture says that our sins stain us. And I don't know what picture comes to your mind when you see a stain, but Scripture says, though our lives be as scarlet, just blood red, stained red with sin, he will wash us white as snow. It's a new life. Baptism is what symbolizes that washing process. I'm just surrendering my life to God, and I, God, I just admit I need to be cleansed. And I just, I'm, I'm choosing, choosing you today. The rest of my life, I'm choosing you. I got other things I've had before you in my life. It's messed my life up. I'm not ending up where I wanted to be. I'm changing direction. I'm changing direction. I'm making a choice to go a different path. And so you come forward, and we're just gonna give you a towel. We have clothes for you to change into. We are prepared for you, even though you didn't know you came today to do this. We, we, we did know. We got private dressing rooms, we'll get you changed, and then we're gonna get you baptized, and we're gonna celebrate like crazy people, all right? And by the way, no one will ever celebrate your decision to get baptized more than we will in the next few moments. Just understand that. You're making a choice to go down a path, not travel as much as other paths. And she said, there's a road that leads to heaven, and it's narrow, and there's a road that leads to hell, and a whole bunch of people are on it. Choose carefully path you choose to walk. So I'm going to pray. You come on. As soon as I get them praying, they're going to start and you just come on down, grab a towel and let's get busy. Let's go to work everywhere. That's what we're going to do online. You hang on. We're going to get you baptized too. Let's pray. So Father, let's stand, stand before we pray. We're not seeing you. We stand. And there goes Kaylin with my table. Pray with me, church. So Father, thank you for the opportunity to choose better, to not choose poorly. And God, the truth is, as many of us have chosen very, very poorly, which just sums up the condition of our life. It's all caught up with us. It's added up to what we've become. And we don't want to be this anymore. So we want to do something different. And God, it's not about intention. It's about direction. And direction is about a choice and a path and a crossroads. And God, I pray that we would choose wisely right now. So I, I just ask that you just create a spirit in our, in our worship centers of courage and boldness and fearlessness and people's willingness to say, I'm I'm not going to keep being the same person. And God, they would choose a better life. It's a choice, and it's theirs right now to make. So in Jesus' name we pray that you would do what only you can do. Amen. You come on down. Amen. We are going to praise. We're going to party. We're going to celebrate. And if today that's you, you're saying, I'm ready to make a public declaration of my faith in Jesus. I want to reiterate that invitation. You're welcome to come down, grab a towel. The water is warm. And we're going to celebrate alongside you with everything that we've got. Here we go.
I don't know what's going on in all the other worship centers around the valley, but I know what's happening here. A whole bunch of people have already made a decision to come forward. And we're interrupting this song because I want to just say one more thing to you. And I want to do everything within my power to plead with you to change your mind if you need to change your mind and come forward and you haven't done that yet. You know, it's interesting. This rich young ruler came up to Jesus and he asked him the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And uh, what I said was, what the question was, was what do I have to do to live a life when I won't look back at the end of it and regret the choices I made? That's how I worded that. Do you understand that when this man chose to walk away from Jesus for the rest of his life, he would have reflected back on that opportunity that he missed. He had Jesus right in front of him. And Jesus said, this is what you need to do. And he said, no. The rest of his life, I think he would try to recapture that moment this moment right now is your moment. It's your moment. It's your time. It's your opportunity. Now, again, a bunch of people have already come forward, and I'm assuming that's happening. What's going to be really, really cool in the next few moments is we're going to experience this across all of our campuses. This is a church-wide moment, and it really, really matters. If you need to say yes to Jesus, right now is the time for you to move forward here and there. Come on down.